Hey everybody, Adam Savage and Stephen Lane. And Stephen, we are in your office right now. The inner sanctum of prop store, absolutely. This is whenever I am interacting with another collector, there's talking about the collection and then there's going into the pieces that they need to look at all the time. Sure. And yeah. that's what this is, right? That's some of that. This is yeah. your museum. Yeah, yeah. Well, my museum, my, my personal collection, my private collection, yeah. yeah. And things move in and out of this. They do, yeah. I mean, I've been collecting now for 30 years, I suppose. Yeah. Coming on 30 years. Yeah. God, where did that time go? But over that period of time, I've seen some treasures that have come into me and I've had to move them on just to help build the business as sure. much as anything else. You know, Prop Store has been a machine in itself that there's, there's bills to pay, there's mouths to feed, and uh, you can't keep hold of everything. Oh, that's a tough one. It is a tough one. Uh, however, within that hierarchy of difficult decisions, I would suspect that uh, this is this is a really, really precious piece. This it, is an insane lineage of Star Wars costume. It is, yeah. And look, Star Wars is incredibly important to me, and it's inc also incredibly important to part of my journey. Yeah. It was really the, the little action figures that sort of got me into collecting. It was seeing Star Wars for the first time at the cinema with my parents when I was sort of seven or eight years old. And it's that that sort of spurned the start of collecting, not knowing that I would end up perhaps <laughs> with something quite like this. Yeah. But it's just, it, it's, it sparked it for me. You know, that was, that, that was the genesis of it all. And this, the Tuscan Raider mask from Star Wars A New Hope. So this is the original film, 1977, of course. Do we know which mask this is? We know exactly which <gasps> mask this is. So this is screen match. So this is the mask that was worn by Peter Diamond. So this is the stunt guy who was out in Tunisia, all dressed up for the attack on Luke. So this that is... might be the, that's the first time we see a sand person or yes, the first time yeah. we see the face yeah, up, that's close. Right, up close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you get them in the distance to start with, don't you? And then he's got the binoculars out. The macro is out and then that rises up ahead oh. right above him and and there's some great shots of that as well you know i think that what's really astounding about this piece is the fact that it's not only so prominently featured for that one sequence in the film and that's one of the reasons i've got the action figure here is because that image of that that at that moment that right. sequence was everywhere it was in the poster magazines yeah. it was on all the product it was on the merch it was on all the publicity material and I think, you know, when I saw Star Wars for the first time and the Tusken Raider rises up, you're just like, what the heck is that? Not only is it what the heck is that, but it really is a harbinger of how big the universe you've just jumped into can be. Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and it's just all it does is raise questions rather than present answers. And it sort of sends you into this, you know, this hole yeah. where... 30 years later, I'm still going, what is that? And where, you know, where did this come from? And what's their backstory? And I, I think it's, uh, it's just astonishing that it sits here between us today, frankly. I, I love the fact that we still have Tusken Raiders in the Mandalorian series, Legacy Effects built a bunch of new masks, all using the same techniques. I also love as I, I reached out and touched, it looks like a heavy duck canvas, but in fact, it's a very lightweight fabric, which is, is a classic costume move. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. But it's it's actually really very heavy at the front of this. So, I would imagine so, these are all machined aluminum pieces. Yeah, machine, machined aluminum pieces. Indeed. Aluminium. Yeah, it was made, <laughs> made in England. <laughs> Fair uh, enough. So yeah, machined uh, <laughs> aluminum pieces, but also just all the, the massive leather work here and yeah. also so this huge lump of aluminium that you've got here too means that it's very, very forward carrying. You know, it's this is actually quite a difficult piece. I have this on display in my collection at home uh, most of the time, bought it in especially for you guys today. Oh, and it's always, you know, I'm always very wary. You can see that we've actually bolted a plate yeah. onto the stand here just to make sure that it's not gonna pivot forward. Um, and uh, and there's a lot of acrylic in here that holds that in place. So if this was to slam down, you know, there's a big mass of acrylic that can just pop apart and, <laughs> and, it, and it could be a bit of a nightmare. This is a mask I have always wanted to replicate. This is a costume I've always wanted to make. Um, I, I came in here and I saw this and then I asked you if you knew which one it was and the fact that it's that one. Yeah. When you obtain this uh, and you realize that it was fully screen matched, that had to have been like so exciting. Oh, it was incredibly exciting, yeah. I mean, it was a piece that I knew matched before I acquired it. So okay. I, we, I knew what I was talking about, and I knew what I was, you know, making an offer for, and so yeah. did the person that I was buying it sure. from. So there was definitely that uh, degree of understanding. There was no no surprises. That the wraps were certainly all over the place. You know, after many many years of being in storage oh, and moving of around, they were. you know, you can see there's sort of remnants of dry glue all over this, mm -hmm. and that's essentially where it was just dobbed in place on the day. Right. And right. so there was a, a, a small amount of. Uh, 
uh, I suppose, redressing when I got it mm -hmm, back. Mm -hmm. um, the other interesting element was actually that this leather work here, which we see at the front, yeah. which, is, which is sort of this tan colour leather, yeah. all of this had faded down and it had gone this really unusual sort of uh, red colour. And in fact, oh. you can still see some of this. So I'm just going to lean in front of this yeah, a little yeah. bit. Inside, see, see around the eyes here, uh -huh. around the eye socket here. That's actually that sort of uh, unusual, sort of faded down. There, there we go. So you can see where there's a leather wrap just underneath. Oh yeah, leather. look at that. Yeah, and that's the colour that all this sort of <gasps> mouth section had gone. Probably just UV degradation over the years, or maybe it was, you know, dyed very quickly to get the colour that they wanted to, and and that was an and, you know, and it's just it yeah. just wasn't that stable. But um, that, that had all faded. So I had a little bit of work done to it here as well when I acquired it. It's really but, nice uh, work. It doesn't show at all. No, no. And that's always a consideration when you're, when you're working with an artifact that's 40 years old. It's just <laughs> like, you know, what, what do you need to do to it to, to ensure that it aesthetically still presents as you want it to, but at the same time, there we go. Look Dude, at that. I, look, I know we're just showing the back of the camera. But <laughs> we, we've got it a, is, we've got it is, got it is nothing but the iconic <laughs> piece. Holy cow. Yeah, I mean, it's staggering, isn't it? Wow. Absolutely. Absolutely unbelievable. Yeah. All right, I want to talk about another screen matched piece you've got here. Sure, yeah, let's just slide um, that one very carefully out. Yeah. Uh, there we go. I will tell you, as a young artist, as a young maker of things, H.R. Giger was so important. His aesthetic was something I had to build a lot of pieces of sculptures and ideas just to kind of understand what his aesthetic meant to me and kind of get it out of my system. This, tell me about this. Well, I think most people are going to recognize this pretty much immediately. This, this is obviously the, the space jockey, the maquette for the space jockey from Alien, uh, really Scott's Alien. Uh, it's made of plaster, so it's quite heavyweight. Oh, wow. Uh, again, uh, been quite considerate with the display stand that we built for this, or uh, I've had created for it to ensure that it's really well wedged down in there, because it does have a sort of core that drops down as well. Right, and I noticed you have the, uh, this comes out and it's protected out it. to the extent. You got it, yeah, the display case sits over the top <laughs> of it just to keep the dust off it as well. Um, there have been a few of these. A number of these have popped up over the years, which is not unusual for an art department maquette. You would expect that. It goes yeah. to different departments, construction department, painting, you know, whatever set deck people might have had it as well. What's great about this particular iteration is the fact that I bought this directly from producer Ivor Powell. Wow. Um, so it sat in his collection for, you know, 30, 40 years before I acquired it from him. And when I acquired it from him, you know, he was like, yeah, this is absolutely the main one that we were working from in the art department. So I went and, and dug out the, the uh, Giga's making of Alien book oh, here. And, a key uh, part of my library. Yeah, it's a great book, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, you delve into a little bit of Giga's mind there. And uh, there we go, on page 34, we can actually see the, there's a photo of a, a maquette. Uh, on within the sort of miniature set uh, design, the set build as well that it's situated within. And I look very closely at this and got a magnifying glass out. And actually, you can see there's some very specific stripes that are, that are airbrushed in here in sort of white paint. And so if we then turn back and actually spin this around the camera mm -hmm. very carefully, we can see that that exact stripe work here is yeah just all the way along this pipe work here and once i twigged that then i started looking at the rest of it in more detail and it's unquestionably this maquette that's in giga's book now of course giga was re renowned for working with airbrush you know that was one of the mediums that he was very comfortable uh, with during this particular era yeah. and so i think there's a strong possibility i have met giga before he uh, he sadly passed away i never got the chance to actually ask him the question and whether or not he would remember yeah. but you know this is likely i would say bearing in mind the influence and and just the involvement that he had that he probably airbrushed this as well. So Amazing. not only is it the art department of McKen, not only is it in his book, but this is actually a piece done by Giga, painted by Giga. How cool um, is that, man? That's insane. <laughs> Absolutely insane. I love noticing as I looked at it, how it's not perfectly symmetrical. It's yeah. a little bit off and it's got a little bit of a lean on the left side. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, we've seen that in some of this, the films from this era and it actually works so well with the eye then, doesn't it, as well? Yeah. You know, because you, you feel that it has that more organic nature to it. It's not something that's been machined out perhaps, but... Um, you know, a lot of what we talk about when we talk about the special effects pieces that you have in your collection, uh, these are objects created with narratives that go far deeper than the filmmakers even know. 
Yes. Right? And the whole idea is to communicate worlds within worlds that we can't understand. Yes. And yeah. Giger is one who is so other. I love that quote from Ridley Scott. When I saw Giger's work, I knew my problems were over or just beginning. <laughs> like, that totally tracks. Yeah, yeah. No, you're right. And it, and it is, uh, you know, when we've spoken about this a few times, it is the mystery, isn't it, that these things present when they're, when they're put before us on screen. It, it is to tell part of the story, but not so much where it's explaining everything. They, they, they want you to yeah. go away and think about this. It's a cerebral thing, isn't it? And, uh, and this... Uh, encapsulates so much. You know, I'm very passionate about sci-fi. Uh, you know, as you know, I own one of the, the spacesuits from Alien as well. I have a yeah. few other bits and pieces. Star Wars means a great deal to me as well. So these are some of, just a couple of the treasures from my collection that I've managed to uh, to acquire over the years. I just love the idea of Giger sitting there with an airbrush doing yeah. the detailing on this. Yeah. It is also, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of times maquettes that get re-released uh, are overly cleaned up, and there is a roughness to this that feels completely right. Yeah, you yeah. You know, there's an aspect of like the way the arms are sculpted, and some of it you can see is like, yeah, that's good enough. Yeah. Or, this is the right gesture. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's not pin sharp, is it? No. It's just giving you enough there, isn't it? And it doesn't need to be. And there's lots of shots in there of uh, of Giger on set with the full size version of this yeah. working away and doing his paintwork on that as well. So the involvement was literally from start to finish on it. I I'll tell you, I see the chipped away white parts of plaster, and I want to come with a brush and no, <laughs> <laughs> not it's on this just, one, man. No, I know, I know. Of course, it's just it's in my nature to want to repair. Uh, what a beautiful piece! I'm so honored to be able to actually see it up close. Thank you, sir. That's been a pleasure, man. Hey guys, Adam Savage from Tested here. If you've ever seen the six inch ruler in inches and centimeters on my forearm and wanted one of your own, but you didn't want it to be permanent, well, today's your lucky day. You can now buy temporary tattoos of my measuring stick, my measuring forearm, uh, at tested-store.com. Comes like this, goes on in about 30 seconds with a little water. The instructions are on the back. It comes off with rubbing alcohol, and hopefully it warms you up to the idea of permanently attaching a measuring device to your body, because I use mine every single day.